Hello, I'm Yonika Kuman. I am a professor of sociology and international studies and gender studies at Willamette University in Oregon. Well, thank you for being a uh, part of this and joining in this discussion. We're going to talk about two of your papers. One's forthcoming and uh, one is published. Uh, the first one is International Relations slash Black Internationalism, Reimagining Teaching and Learning about Global Politics. And the other one is called Madness in the Classroom, Thomas uh, Sankara, Disobedient International Relations. And they're both fantastic. Um, and I think they really build one upon the other. So I would like you to begin by telling us about your work and how you came to these papers and what you learned in, in kind of creating them. Thank you. Um, um... Not to be too self-centered, I'll start a little bit with my own education and some of the things that were lacking in my education to kind of tell the story of how I came to write these papers. So I grew up um, in the UK and the Dutch education systems. You can probably hear that in my accent. And um, I went to university in the UK. I'm very grateful. Um, it was all free and paid for. Uh, and I studied international relations there. And um, my parents went to college later in life and they really emphasized the importance of education. But I was the first person to go as an 18 year old in my family. And I was very excited to study international relations because my mother and my father had raised me with a real international perspective. Um, they were um, peace activists, anti-apartheid. Um, uh, they were part of the anti-apartheid solidarity movements. Um, and they really infused us with a international uh, sensibility. So when I got to university, super pumped. My parents were really supportive. Um, I was just so um, kind of gobsmacked to realize how uh, limited the official bodies of knowledge were in the field of international studies, which is such an important field. It's about war and peace. Um, it's about uh, international institutions, UN, can they help promote peace? It's about the international political economy. And really it's about questions of global change. Can we change the world, right? Uh, and I, had, I felt such a big contrast between the kind of rich, informal, uh, but grounded uh, perspectives I'd, I'd grown up with. And then this disciplinary knowledge, uh, which was very abstracted, very aloof from everyday people's struggles. And it was also, you know, as we often discuss in these, um, it was, you know, very elite white, at the time, really all men um, on the syllabus um, as well. Even in the 90s, when I went to college, it was still a very male-dominated uh, discipline. Not just that, it was very US, UK, a couple Canadians, Germans, and some Australians. Um, not to summarize, but at the time, it was very myopic. And it seemed such a contrast to what I was hoping to learn. And I imagine what others were hoping to learn, too, like this people come to a field of study like that, hoping to broaden their vision, not have it really confined. Um, so uh, I always felt that dissatisfaction, but maybe because I I don't know why, but um, for some reason it compelled me to keep studying in that field. Um, I thought if I just study this field more, maybe I'll get to the stuff I'm looking for um, and had very, I eventually went to graduate school in the US in Minnesota, where I had very supportive professors um, who were very open minded. But there was always this, you know, limit to what you could do in international relations. Um, and then I got the opportunity to teach this and it's um, international relations often People in the US in particular take this their first year in college, international politics, global politics, international studies. And it's often, you know, a lot of students come to these classrooms really hoping for some vision, some guidance, some, some uh, maybe inspiration or maybe some connection to their lives. Um, 
in Minnesota I had a lot of refugee students or students who were the children of refugees. Uh, many uh, came from East Africa, some came from West Africa, uh, some were Hmong, um, very diverse classrooms at the time in the University of Minnesota. Um, um, other students had um, cross borders or their families had cross borders or experienced war in other ways. Um, and then all students were working in this global economy, often as low wage workers, um, as debtors, um, as future debtors, you know, um, um, but people had a lot of questions about the world and um, how they relate to it and um, how they could change it for the better, often for their families, for their siblings, for their children. And then, of course, the wars in Iraq, Afghanistan and beyond. Um, we had a lot of students who were sent uh, overseas to fight these wars or came back sometimes with injuries from these wars as well. And I felt honestly that our field of study had very little to offer uh, these students and particularly the traditional way in which we teach that first year international relations course that um, 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 so many students take. And I felt this, I was guiding students on this disappointing journey through this um, very white, um, narrow field. Now I gotta say the field has really been changing and challenging as well. I'm really describing what I, I, I was facing uh, and the students were facing at that time. So I felt this urgent need to do something different. Um, so um, as I got more um, confident as a teacher and a little bit more freedom within the different institutions that I worked, um, I started um, um, we always have to teach this traditional discipline. It's a kind of a discipline where you learn about Woodrow Wilson um, and the Cold War, and uh, but from a very Eurocentric or US centric perspective. But I thought, what if um, we start reading black internationalist authors alongside these texts? Um, so I started experimenting with that and students responded so well. Um, um, they loved reading what Malcolm X said about the United Nations. They loved reading what Du Bois said about war. Um, they love reading people like Jamaica Kincaid on the global economy and its everyday workings. Um, so, so I started calling the class international relations slash black internationalism. I didn't put that in the course catalog. That was just kind of how I worked it. And, um, and then I had an amazing student, uh, Salome Ayuak, who um, I think I mentioned in the, the papers, definitely in other papers. And she really, um, she's a, she was a history undergrad um, and many other things to a community educator. And she, she uh, really introduced me to the language of reading against the grain. Um, so she provided that language that she had um, really taken to in history courses is that we were reading the this traditional international relations li literature on war and peace, the Eurocentric literature, and we were reading it kind of alongside, um, against, beyond um, black international thinkers who are thinking about similar topics, but in a very different context, usually as part of revolutionary struggle, a quest to change the world, a quest for black liberation. So. Oh yeah, and that, that's um, fascinating how, not only how academic fields change, but also what I'm really impressed with in your work is this, as you were just describing this reading against the grain and you know, a lot of what's come out and talked about is amplifying uh, black and um, internationally uh, di you know, diverse voices. And I really feel like you give a really nice um, and succinct way of how you're doing that as a model of how others may do it as well. So could you give us more of an example what international relations from the, I mean, <laughs> you bring up Wilson, I mean, anyone who's studied American history knows 
horrible, horrible racist. And, you know, just how did, you know, so even coming to the reckoning of how his racism informed his foreign policy mm-hmm. is something that's just coming up now in the history yeah. of uh, confrontational to his legacy, I guess. But I guess my point is, how can you, um, how do you do it? And then we'll get into some of the thinkers. So, you know, is it just assigning things and discussing or what else are you doing? Oh, yeah, I hear what you're saying. Um, so I have a colleague in Canada, Yolanda Buka, um, and she she wrote so powerfully. She said, um, black minds, black people, black bodies uh, matter in international relations. I'm, I'm paraphrasing. She says it much better. And so black scholarship matters. Um, um, and there are always black scholars theorizing war, peace, um, and they were systematically excluded from our field of study. And that's been documented now by people like Vitalis. Um, so they were written out of international relations. Um, um, and I think Henderson, a scholar called Henderson, uh, talks about how they formed the Howard School of International Studies. Um, but also Black people matter in international relations, right? Um their contributions to the world. Um, and Yolanda Booker writes and thinks a lot about how uh, black people, black soldiers, black families, Africans, African families were such a central part of the world wars that we often study from a Eurocentric uh, perspective as just one example. Um, um, so that, that mindset, and then also the students in our class, they matter. Um, I think so long we saw it in the national relations as if it's a very um, unusual introductory class in that it's quite similar around the world. So they introduce you to all these theories week by week. Um, at least that was how it was done back in, in, in the day. There's some challenges to that now. Um, but as if all the students in the room are interchangeable. So the students matter and the students may be black, but they, you know, maybe, maybe of any background, but really that they are, they have a lot of knowledge about the world. Um, they come with all these experiences. They may not totally have the language for them, but all this knowledge about what it means to live in this white supremacist world system. And um, they want to talk about that. They want to make sense of it and they want to hear from other people um, about that. And I think that was, when I really think about it, that was missing in my own education, that ability um, to connect and learn from students and not just students, community members, loved ones, families, and really recognizing that community knowledge that we have about international relations that isn't just in academic journals, that isn't at uh, fancy conferences, that isn't from elite professors or professors anywhere, you know. Um, So that's a little bit about what I was thinking about. And when I've been so lucky that I have had students who really invested in me, um, who were like, we're going to tell her, you know, what we need in our classroom. Not that I lived up to it, um, but they really took the time to to say to stay after class and talk more, reflect more, share their stories. And then together um, we were able to try some different things in the classroom or some different ways that were maybe a little less hierarchical, a little less professor um, dumping words onto young people. Um, so was, I've been um, very fortunate. The other thing I've been very fortunate is that I've, especially in the last uh, five years, been part of writing collectives with um, really amazing scholars and scholar activists um, around the world. And they've really helped me learn and think as well. Well, and one of the things that I've, I've noticed in all post-colonial uh-huh. critique and you know uh-huh. critiques of colonialism, white supremacy, all this, is that it the first step in it is exposing the hypocrisy and the lie, which mm. is writing out voices like yeah. 
writing yeah. out like Malcolm X. And writing, yeah. the fact that these voices are present and being subjugated and stripped of humanity and agency and all of the things that make a scholar a scholar, right? Yeah. Well, a commentator contributes to that colonial project. So anyone who's outside the grain is immediately thought of as what we label them communists. Now it's woke. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yeah. It's like <laughs> delegitimization. Mm -hmm. The white supremacy. I don't, I mean, colonialism is a good term yeah. for it too, but that the, just white supremacy is to do. Yeah. Let's get yeah. in some of these voices. And yeah. mm -hmm. you bring in Du Bois as a mm -hmm. between uh, international relations and daily lived racism. And I'd love to talk about his idea because you talk and it, it's fantastic in the, about the African roots of war and mm -hmm. how he's exposing that mm -hmm. lie at the at the heart of the colonial project. Yeah. Um, it, it's really interesting what you say. You, on the one hand, you want to expose a white discipline, <laughs> or a whitewash discipline, or a white exclusionary discipline. On the other hand, these students are coming to the class. They're first year students. I'm really, really committed to teaching these first year student classes. Um, they they don't know anything about this colonial discipline, right? So. I've, I've gone back and forth a little bit. Like, do I want to expose and unpack or just present them with something new? And I've tried different different ways. And there's somewhere in the middle ground. Uh, I think that is, is, is useful. So Du Bois actually, um, Du Bois is a really important thinker. I would love to just teach a class on Du Bois one day. And I'm sure my department would be super supportive on that. Um, but he also provides a kind of anchor for us because we're teaching students, maybe it's their first semester in college. And of course we don't wanna boil history down to individuals, but we also wanna tell stories that are um, recognizable, especially when they're international, because the international can feel really far away and really, really uh, above and beyond anything we're doing. And Du Bois is a person who was literally there almost always. You know, you talk about the founding of the UN. He was there. You talk about the peace conference after World War One. He was there. You know, he studied abroad in Germany during the Third Reich. You know, um, like if if there was a Pan Africanist conference, he probably organized it. Um, so Du Bois is very uh, important for us uh, on both levels. So the African Roots of War um, is a text I really start the class with maybe not the first date but um very soon it's written in 1915 so in the middle the kind of early years of world war one I. I always have to remind students he doesn't mention world war one because that wasn't what it was called yet um that i learned that the hard way um and um um the um a a colleague of mine, Susan Kang, introduced me to this text um, when we were grad students because I was teaching this class for the first time. And I'm like, Susan, we can't be teaching it the old way. <laughs> um, um, how do we bring a sense of um, how important colonialism, um, um, worker exploitation uh, was in world history and world politics. And she recommended I start with this text. And it's taken me many years to figure out how to present it to first year students um, in different contexts, like in Minnesota, in Oregon, in, you know. Um, but um, I've loved working with this text. Um, it is challenging, but it's not um, too challenging. So Du Bois is really writing to the audience of the Atlantic Monthly. Um, so I imagine he was thinking about maybe intellectuals, maybe white intellectuals when he's writing this. And he's saying, you know, you are focusing on the wrong things when you're thinking about the roots of this uh, ostensibly European war. 
uh, he's saying the roots of this war go way back to European conquest of Africa, particularly the scramble for Africa in the 19th century. And then he says, and that scramble for Africa has its roots in centuries of exploitation of African, African peoples, particularly through the transatlantic slave trade. And he traces that history. And of, obviously he's using language from 1915. So we have to work with students on that. But his language really carries, his message really carry, carries. So what he's really doing, I, I tell students, is he's unpacking what we now call racial capitalism, the way an exploitative world system um, tried to exploit workers um, around the world. And when European workers started rising up, um, European powers, particularly in the 19th centuries, looked to exploit African, African labor as uh, sometimes we say a wedge, uh, sometimes we say, um, you know, as a, a as a racist project to divide the international working class. Um, so he he shows that in really visible language and he uses democracy really richly. So he challenges limited notions of representative democracy uh, within Europe. And he also introduces ideas about economic democracy. Um, so we shouldn't just uh, can have a vote. We should also have a say in how we work, how we labor um, and the fruits that of, of our labor. And he shows that uh, how um, capitalists and ruling class really use race, racism, and colonialism uh, um, to undermine um, democracy, both political democracy and economic democracy. He also offers a vision, right? A vision for a, a different world. Um, I'd say a, a vision for Black liberation, but also a vision for world liberation. And um, he uses the language of uh, land, um, so he said, we need to return the land. And I think he, more broadly, he's saying we need to give people, <laughs> stop exploiting people. Um, but the land is really important. Give people their land back. He talks about um, independence, um, political independence as well. And then he talks about education um, as a solution for war. So this is a time where we're not hearing give Africans back their land as a solution for world peace from Woodrow Wilson um, and, and, and uh, European leaders either. Uh, so he's really challenging that limited peace prescription that we see emerging after World War I already during the war. And he becomes a big advocate um, for anti-colonial movements as a route to world peace. And then he talks about the importance of Black people, Black people in the diaspora, the descendants of slaves in building a, a project for peace um, and thinking, offering knowledge about peace. So he's he actually points to uh, descendants of enslaved people in the U.S. as a source of the solution, as a um, as as people who can help contribute to world peace, um, which, to my knowledge no other international relations text that is rec assigned or recognized, um, especially in that period, um, 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 makes that contribution. And and you make uh, the point in the article too, that he, he makes a point about, you have to notice how race factors in. And that's what you were talking about and how we have to make a, a norm out of it. So if it has to be part of the conversation. And it's still, mm -hmm. you know, it, it's fascinating when you were talking about it, too, because, um, you know, we often hear that race is used to divide us and control things. But it's also a tool that was invented by and for mm -hmm. this project, colonialism. I mean, yeah. you know, created to mm -hmm. different people and to create this um, subgrouping. Mm -hmm exploited and did not. And that's why I found, and yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I, I love reading it with students because um, the text is very rich and it's not conventional kind of abstract social science. So it's poetic in parts. 
and um and he documents the type of racism that emerged during the 19th century where using pseudo religion pseudo science as a justification for for this um renewed conquest of of africa and african wealth african labor um more broadly right um and students are somehow sometimes really surprised because incoming students are often as they unpack their ideas they were like well war is inevitable racism is inevitable and you know we have to try and fix it but it's a long history and Du Bois really shows racism in its current form is a it's not new but its current form is very particular and it's particular to this um colonial project um emerged out of this colonial project uh, he also traces you know the long lineages of racism through the transatlantic slave trade of course but he really shows how it takes on the specific form in the 19th century to justify this scramble for africa and particularly to justify it to these white working class european people who were not ne necessarily pro-colonialism they really had to be fed this ideological uh, project um, um, over time. Um, that's what I see in the text, at least. There are many, many interpretations, but I love seeing students see how this um, is not inevitable um, and it may not be forever, right? Um, uh, just as elites organize this project of racism and white supremacy, uh, we can also organize projects of peace of liberation, of solidarity. Um, um, we, we don't necessarily have to get there in one day, you know, but we, we, we start introducing these ideas over time. Well, and I want to jump ahead to the other um, piece you're working on, and it has not yet come out, is the Thomas mm -hmm. era, because I think he, he speaks specifically to what we're talking about in what you were just talking about with yeah. an alternate form of... Yeah organizational yeah, yeah. technology. And um, you bring up in, in that paper how he, he sought to challenge uh, dominant international relations order, uh, mm -hmm. by introducing imperialism and neo-colonialism and puppet regimes and, and how you use him to kind of unpack this later form of kind of post-World War II, I guess, um, mm -hmm. ideological disobedience which I thought was just fantastic. <laughs> so visual, visual is always helpful. So um, this is a, um, the Thomas Sankara piece um, that I sent you uh, is part of a collective project. I'm working with uh, Shira Malik, Olivia Rutazibwa, Isaac Kamola, Alan Stack, Anatoly, um, and many others. Uh, so um, it's part of what I've learned from, from that fantastic group of people. Uh, Thomas Sankar was the leader of Burkina Faso in the 1980s. So he's working in a really different time period as Du Bois. Um, and he is speaking from the perspective of neo-colonialism. So just uh, for your for the, your audience, Du Bois um, died in uh, 1963, lived a really long uh, life. And Thomas Sankar is really talking about this era in the early 1980s. So formally, uh, many countries in West Africa and Africa more generally had uh, seen political independence. They had um, their own flags, um, um, but they were effectively still controlled by former colonial powers. So Burkina Faso was known as Upper Volta, and it was still really controlled by France and its puppets um, um, locally. Uh, so Thomas Sankara is part of a group of prof um, progressive soldiers um, that come to power in Burkina Faso, and they introduce ideas about ind true independence, um, real uh, anti-colonialism, liberation from France's economic and political control, um, but also really progressive ideas about women's rights, ecology, uh, caring for children through education and healthcare. 
um, massive tree planting projects, so much more. Um, they even were really into trying to uh, build their own clothes so that they could wear um, um, fa fabrics made locally. And they rename uh, Upper Volta, Burkina Faso, the land of upright people. Uh, you know, the land of the people standing up. And I always, I'm very grateful. I learned about Sankara in my African politics courses from my professor, August Nimps in Minnesota. Uh, and I was like, why are we only learning about this in African politics? He has so much to say to Europeans. A lot of his work is about uh, debt um, and about how illegitimate um, the debt of the um, form, uh, formerly colonized world is. Um, and how the, like Walter Rodney Shankara shows how these countries contributed to the wealth of Europe. Um, they shouldn't be debtors to Europe. Um, so I learned about this in African politics classes through my very amazing professor, but I was like, why are we studying? These are international relations questions. Why is this silent in these fields? So with the group of people I mentioned, we started um, um, really um folding and building this into our international relations courses. And in particular, what I focused on in the piece that I sent you is Thomas Sankara visited the US uh, and he spoke at the United Nations in 1983. Uh, so he came apparently, um, um, it was customary for new political leaders to meet with Ronald Reagan, but apparently Reagan uninvited him. So instead, he spent the day in Harlem, um, which he uh, um, and then said, our White House is in Black Harlem. So he, he gave speeches there. Apparently, it was part of um, a, 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 the Lumumba coalitions, uh, lo local internationalist, Black internationalist groups invited him and hosted him. Um, so he spoke there to the community. and. When he spoke to the community, it was at the Harriet Tubman School, rapturous applause, I think a huge audience. Sankara, he's always wearing his military fatigues and his beret. He had a holstered gun, apparently. Um, and he's speaking in French for an interpreter. But he said, this is what we'll say at the UN tomorrow. Tomorrow, I'll address the United Nations and I'll speak for the people of Burkina Faso. I'll speak for the people of Africa. I'll speak for the third world, and I'll speak for you. So he's really bringing black Americans into that global um, third world movement, um, the, 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 the people striving for, for a better world against the domination of Europe and the US and, and the superpowers. So uh, he makes all these promises in Harlem. He's like, I'll speak for all of us. And then he does that the next day. He, he gives a 45 minute address at that, you know, iconic marble podium. Um, and he speaks about education. He speaks about healthcare. He speaks against militarism. He speaks about women's rights. He speaks about indigenous people and Palestinians. Um, he really connects the apartheid struggle in South Africa to the struggle of the Palestinians. Um, so much. Uh, he also talks about intellectuals and how intellectuals sometimes collude with colonizers um, to produce knowledge that is in the interest of the, the, the powerful. And he speaks about students and how important they are and young people, uh, athletes. He sp spends quite a significant time talking about athletes as well. So he really paints a picture of this gl global, diverse, um, mass group of people who he calls the non-aligned movement in the tradition of Bandung or the third world or, um, you know, um, he, he paints a picture of a very different world, a world that is ready for change, yearning for change, and that has a different way of looking for the world. And so he has a very visionary agenda, a very inclusive agenda uh, um, for um, world wide liberation um and i'm like 
why would we not read this in international relations? Why, why would we stick to Woodrow Wilson's 14 points like, or even the limited vision of the UN Charter? Why would we not read alternative visions? Even if you're really into Woodrow Wilson, wouldn't you want to read something else as well? And um, so I've been teaching that speech, especially the one in Harlem, ever probably about 10 years. And the, um, in Oregon, not that many of my students are of African descent or from Africa. Some are, but uh, not. But students resonate with this vision of um, a global vision of the people who were disinherited or exploited and the people who want a different kind of world. And they, they can find pieces of themselves in that coalition, in that speech. And maybe also, I think it's, you know, it's 1983. It's not now, but knowing that people have been articulating and working to this different kind of world throughout history in the 1980s and beyond, um, I think might be empowering. I hope it is um, because if we just present students with what is, you know, that there's not a lot of, of, of hope. We have to also present crit critiques of the world with visions for, for a better world. I think we have to balance. Well, and, it, and I think, yes, your, your point is well made. And I think that trying to put these, because in, in the dominant conversation, there is only one side. And the other side is constantly being discredited, silenced, mm -hmm. cut out of history. So how do you feel about some of the, have you had pushback from kind of the conservative, small C conservative, mm -hmm. you know, preserving the status quo and the, the international relations as great powers kind of mm -hmm. thing? Um, how it, how does that conversation look in the classroom? And I I know what you mean. Um, I found that when when I first started doing this, the the biggest obstacle was my my own sort of training. I was like, am I allowed to do this? Am I allowed? And I was like, oh, yeah, <laughs> let's see, <laughs> you know, but. I did have some sort of voices in my head saying like, oh, be careful, even though no one explicitly said that, maybe subtly, but not explicitly. And then I had really good mentors who were like, you know, if you're gonna choose this profession, like, it, you know, you can't listen to those voices, the imagined voices or the real voices. Um, and you have to, you have to be accountable to your students and your future students um you have to you have to be accountable not to a discipline or imagine criticisms um not that criticism isn't important um but i think what i first want to listen to is my students concerns my students criticism um i've been very fortunate that my students from diverse political perspectives are really supportive of this so I've had students, you know, who come from the military, who who might say, you know, we see we saw parts of this. Um, you know, they're not making a political argument, but they might find something um, in the Black international tradition that they have also witnessed. Um, we have uh, right wing students sometimes who are very concerned about um, U.S. Um, the way they perceive it is U.S. Um, supporting the rest of the world militarily in, in their way of seeing things. But they might also find something here because we might stand back and ask bigger questions is why do we understand peace in terms of militarism? Um, and I found young people in particular, and my students are overwhelmingly very young, um, not not intellectually, but in age. Um, young people are willing to ask those questions. Um, we don't have to agree on the ideological framework, but thinking 
big about what kind of world we'd want to live in um, questions that my education never posed. Um, students are very willing to do that. Um, and if I can show that um, I will be a trustworthy partner, so I won't um, look for a specific kind of vision or a specific kind of outcome, but I will honor their visions. And that big kind of rethinking of the world has to come also with this grounded examination of how power works in our own lives. Um, because all students struggle um, in very different ways. And we can think about how our struggles are connected. Um, so I found that across ideologies and demographics and uh, perspectives, generations even, um, we can have those conversations because they're not bound to kind of US specific blue state, red state, partisan political broadcasting, that we are expanding the terms of our language, we're expanding our minds um, to go a bit beyond that. So in, in that respect, um, I've had a lot of, um, I've learned a lot from students, all students, um, and I've, I feel like they've been very generous in their trust. Like sometimes we we read out Thomas Sankara's speeches out loud because he did a lot of call and response. So we want to kind of get that an energy. I've, I feel like students um, really trusted that I wasn't trying to indoctrinate them, Thomas Sankara, but we're trying to feel what it might be like to be in 1983 and to be talking collectively about the world instead of just individually. Um, so um, that's one example. So I really um, also just want to shout out this generation of students who are, I love all students, but this generation of students, I have never seen anything like their willingness to think about justice worldwide and put their bodies and their on the line um, to invest their futures in in this, I'm I'm really blown away with with the current generation of students. They get a lot of crap, honestly. That people are like, oh, they can't concentrate, they don't read enough. I'm like, let's focus on all the things they do do in very difficult circumstances, um, circumstances that people my generation didn't face. I didn't face student debt like these students face, you know? I, I didn't have to work as longer hours at night as, as they face. I had a funded, I had a robust welfare state supporting me. Um, um, so I'm just so impressed with, with students. And I really wanna make that very explicit uh, because it also goes against some of the narratives that we hear about young people. Well, it occurs to me too, that this is the first generation since like the 2000 to today that grew up without, I mean, the I, I guess you could say the, the post 9-11 world and the state and the, but we had a 20 year war, which wasn't ideological necessarily, or at least it wasn't. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, the Cold War before it, and then the two world wars, and we're in this weird space of like, what is the overriding? Who are the good guys? Who are the bad guys? Where are the communists? Where, you know, that's the, there isn't quite that black and white dichotomy. Yeah, and there's potential in that. Um, there's a lot of potential um, in, in students. I hope I'm not painting too rosy a picture, but students are not bound out about as um, constricted by um, really fixed ideas of remember the axis of evil. Um, we don't. Um, we talk about that and how that shaped world politics. Um, but but I don't think students naturally are coming in thinking that there's evil, evil people in the world. And maybe we we all do some work to unpack it. But it's not in the same way that I. You know, I started teaching um, in two thousand one. Um, September 2001 and there were years where we had to be so careful to 
introduce any critical thought about the world and the US's militaries and US government's role in the world. Uh, we had not that we didn't do it, but we were so um, careful to meet the students where they were at. Um, and now the students are coming in with questions about, they are coming in actively with questions about the US's role in the world, um, the US complicity uh, with military projects, the US uh, government's complicity in genocide. They're coming in with those questions and they, they probably sign up for the class hoping to get answers to those kind of questions. Um, this is a real opportunity, there's just a real potential for this generation to make different kinds of knowledge, um, to build different kinds of solidarities, to, I think they will um, blow us all out of the water, um, especially because they're finding ways to connect internationally across many kinds of difference through their uh, impressive use of social media uh, and other, other ways, for example. Um, I think they'll blow us all out of the water. Uh, that's my hope, you know, uh, that, that's what I'm clinging on to. Well, I, I share that hope. And I think uh, from what I've seen too, the, uh, the kids that are behind them are even more uh, willing to uh, explode mm -hmm. and some of the mm -hmm. kids we have in the Yeah, and I think um, our job is, I've, I've been trying to reflect on what the job of the middle-aged person is in this, <laughs> you know, as I deal with my own... Uh, you know, aging. And I'm thinking your your project is a really good example, creating archives um, of struggle, archives of knowledge that people can access, use, translate. Um, um, I see students doing that as well and uh, um, helping facilitate spaces for them to do that, um, um, uh, helping them apply for, 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 funding when they need it or just supporting them, um, recognizing their strengths, talking them up. Um, I think, uh, yeah, I, I think that's one way that, that our, our generation can, can support them. And Angela Davis, that's my current work is on Angela Davis. She said that uh, young people, they stand on the shoulders of the the activists that came before, the scholar activists that came before. So they see a whole lot more, <laughs> but they're also a bit wobbly, you know, cause they're standing on the shoulders. So we shouldn't like zero in on their apparent mistakes. We should really in encourage that um, mistake making process as part of learning and growth and not um, hold that, hold them to, to, to these unachievable standards, but really ex respect that they see more than us. Um, so that I'm, I really try to keep keep that uh, learn that guidance from Angela Davis in mind. And I think that's really helpful. And I think um, you're providing a great um, service by, by teaching these classes and also by addressing the work, because I think, um, you know, pulling the curtains down on the on the colonial project and, and showing letting the sunlight in really does is a necessary task and someone has to create as you were saying these spaces where these voices aren't only amplified but they're made primate you know prime uh, the primacy of their voices are are heard outside of the the, the critique of yeah. maybe what is yeah or you know failing yeah this yeah, yeah. I, I just want to reiterate again how generous students are because a lot of us that started this kind of effort I mean there's always been people doing this but you know you you can't assign a textbook usually there are some good textbooks now but in general you're kind of developing your own curriculum and that's really good it's really organic because you collaborate with students and sometimes you know, like you know, you make mistakes or it's just really hard, or um maybe there's a voice or an actual person saying you can't do it. Um and I find that students are just very generous with that. That they even before they have all the language, they recognize that there's something different going on. 
um, in in these kind of classroom spaces, um, and 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 they will they will go there. So I just want to really recognize the students and um, just the younger generations in general. They're, they're, they we can all learn from their kind of I'd say intellectual humility, their willingness to go there. Um, usually I find students because I, I really like teaching them the first and second semester in college and I usually find that they really want to unpack their high school history classes that's what they, you know as soon as you open that door everyone's got a story they're willing to share and I want to shout out to the amazing high school history teachers that really students speak so highly of them um, and they really want to unpack that and they they see it very nuanced they see their teachers uh trying to do something different and they also see the constraints of maybe their banned books or their school board or their you know the wider ideological um limitations so so uh it, that that's i never meant for my class to be the forum where people unpack their high school history experience but it's you know you want to go where the students have energy and so that's been a tremendous uh, um, way in to thinking through how we learn about the world um, and also a great way to get to know ind students as individuals because anyone coming out of high school, especially this generation of students who had such an intensely difficult high school, even middle school experience um, with all the crises, um, um, yeah, they really want to talk about it.